What is poppin' YouTube? Bringing you a dynasty startup strategy video. Hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. Brought on Andrew from over at the League FFB. All of his stuff is linked down below. Absolutely love Andrew and his thought process. Let's go. Hey, Andrew, thanks so much for coming on. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me. Of course, of course. Like I said, guys, go make sure you go follow, subscribe to Andrew's channel in the intro. But we're doing an expert dynasty startup draft that we already did, and we're just going to be breaking down some strategy. So, Andrew, as we're looking at this first round, a lot of quarterbacks off the board. What is your typical first round startup strategy in a super flex league yeah so really in the first round it depends i guess where i'm drafting but typically in my super flex leagues i do like to target that quarterback position early on i actually am one of the people who prefers to double tap that quarterback position too um even as we get into that second round i think for me where i find the most value and where i like drafting the most right now in dynasty startups is I do actually prefer being like 7 to 12 range and then getting that early second round pick. That way I can get a Kyler Murray, a Trevor Lawrence or something like that on the on the turnaround. Yeah, so when we're looking at this, we have eight quarterbacks that came off the board in the first round. So I got stuck with Caleb Williams at the 108. You got my boy CJ Stroud at the 103. Out of all these ADPs, who in the first round was like your favorite pick that you felt like was just really great value that kind of fell to them? Yeah, I mean, as I look at the board right now and I'm, I'm looking at some of the value on this board, I, I really think most of these people are being appropriately valued i think we probably saw anthony richardson go a little high compared to where his adp is at personally i think cj stroud's adp is a little bit high and i know i say that as the guy who drafted him but that is where he is going in startups i just think that his perceived value is probably a little bit more than what his actual points per game value is going to provide your fantasy football teams but i don't necessarily draft my teams as this is what i am going into week one with if i have cj stroud i think i could down tier into a Jalen Hurts, who actually Jalen Hurts, I think he's probably the best value in the first round right here. Either him or Justin Herbert. I know Justin Herbert has some question marks about who's going to play wide receiver for him this year, but I think those guys are probably the best values in the first round right now. So I drafted Caleb Williams at the 108. So for you, we see Justin Jefferson goes at the 109. So is there any quarterback right now out of these first eight quarterbacks that got drafted that you're taking Justin Jefferson, Jamar Chase, CeeDee Lamb, who, however you value the wide receivers? Are you taking any of those guys over any of these first eight quarterbacks that got selected? I don't think that there's a hard answer for this one. I think for me, probably I would swap Caleb Williams and Justin Jefferson because I do think that there's a tiny bit of risk just buying a rookie quarterback in the first round, but there's also a lot of upside. I mean, we know how good Caleb Williams is going to be, or at least we think we know how good he's going to be. Um, and so I don't hate the pick of Caleb Williams over Justin Jefferson, especially the way that your team build went as you got deeper into the draft. I do think Justin Jefferson probably deserves to be right up there at probably seven ish, eight ish. Good to know. Yeah, I thought it went, I thought it went pretty good. I mean, I was trying to get that quarterback. I still have Caleb Williams over Justin Herbert, especially after all the loss of weapons for Justin Herbert. But then as we kind of like go to the end we got Dak Prescott and CMC at the 112 to a one. I mean, that's not going to be happening in your normal startups. But when we kind of look at the second round, I know you said you like to double tap on the quarterbacks. I do too. Kyler Murray got sniped one pick before I picked. So then I had to kind of look down the barrel. I had Marvin Harrison Jr. and the Sun God as my next two options that I could potentially draft. I took Marvin Harrison Jr. just based on the age. No, it's a lot of projection. But as we're kind of looking at this second round, did I do the right strategy for my personal build here after going Caleb Williams? Or what, what would you have done different? Kind of in these first few picks. Yeah, I mean, I, when I'm looking at your strategy, I think what I like about it is that you were quickly able to kind of pivot and go to a rookie stack with Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison. And then what that did is it looks like it kind of formed the way that you went about your team moving forward. You still kept it young the rest of the way. Alave, Nico, T, like you just kept it young. So I don't, I don't hate that strategy. I think if things kind of get off script in the first and second round where you're like, okay, I got to go some direction. I don't ever think it's the wrong direction to go young, especially in dynasty so uh, I don't hate that direction for you and honestly as I look at the second round for me like there's a couple guys that I feel like are values where they were drafted right now some of my favorite picks in the second round right now is you just mentioned him Kyler Murray he's my favorite pick in the second round and honestly where he went here at the 204 that's probably about where he's accurately should be going but I think in startups right now he's not going that high there's a lot of times where he's going that 206 207 208 209 type of range and if he falls down there he's a he's more than a value 
value at that point because he's still going to give you top 10 numbers at the quarterback position. And we also kind of assume that they're going to potentially be adding a Marvin Harrison Jr., maybe a Malik Neighbors, even a Romo Dunze if they move back in the draft. They could be a team that does that. I like Amon Ross St. Brown. And the guy that I drafted, I think Trevor Lawrence is where he's being drafted right now. It seems like a lot of people have basically said Trevor Lawrence is overrated. He's no good. We don't want him. That's That kind of feels like the trajectory that Trevor Lawrence is going right now. And I got him as, what is it, QB, QB 13 off of the board? Like, I feel like at QB 13, that's probably Trevor Lawrence's floor right there. Like, that's probably about where he's going to be. Yeah, no, I'm right there with you. So my my question, so I'm looking at, of course, the second round. Got a lot of great values. We love Kyler Murray. CD Lamb, too, at the 2-2. Two, two. That's that's crazy value. So yep. I clearly went young. Some other people, you got to double tap on the quarterback position. What, when you kind of get here, second round kind of determines for me when you're looking at, am I going to be a contender? Am I going to kind of be a productive struggle rebuilder? Am I going absolutely young? Just because I went Caleb. Williams and Marvin Harrison Jr. doesn't necessarily mean that I'm not going to be contending year one, but kind of starts to, you know, I can't be making some decisions later on. So is second round kind of the the turning point of I'm contending, I'm rebuilding, or do you still kind of have a few more rounds to kind of determine that and startup strategy? That's a good question. I think for me, I like to come in with a soft strategy right away. Like I like to have an idea in mind of what I want to do. And for this specific draft, like my goal was to do a hero running back build and then really hammer that middle round wide receiver to kind of fill out some depth in that wide receiver room, especially because the settings in this startup were three starting wide receivers and two flex. So the wide receiver position was going to have some value. Um, But that's what I came in with. I think really the way that I like to play it, though, is like those first two rounds, really the guys going up here are players that should be helping contenders. They should be helping rebuilders no matter what. They're usually young, high performing assets. So I don't necessarily think in the first two rounds, those top 25, top 24 picks, really you need to have a direction yet. I think you kind of let the draft tell you what it is going to kind of put you in. And then also, I think those first two rounds is really important to kind of see at least if you can catch on to an early trend for some of the league mates that are going to be drafting with you. Like, for example, if I saw you draft Caleb and Marvin Harrison, my thought process already already is that Caleb's going to go young. So I know that when the young players are going to come up on the clock for him, he's probably going to be more likely to pick those guys than maybe or Wheezy, where he went Dak Prescott, Christian McCaffrey. He's probably more of a contender right away. He wants to go in and try and win. So I think those first two rounds is where I'm really trying to get a feel for my league mates, see what type of strategies other people might be doing. But also I'm not too worried about, you know, deciding whether I'm a contender or a rebuilder right away because all of these guys should be good. You bring up a great point. So we're looking at here in the second round, we got Bijan Robson, Jameer Gibbs, and Brees Hall go all go back to back to back. I know when we first started playing Dynasty Fantasy Football back in the day, running backs were king no longer the case. It's all quarterbacks. It's all wide receivers. It's, it's really a lot of ageism that happens. How are you feeling about these running backs in the second round? I mean, you got Trevor Lawrence at the 210, which I think is great value. Would Do you think these are appropriate prices to be paying for these running backs? And kind of how are you viewing that when you're building out your dynasty roster? Yeah, that's funny, man, because I feel like when I started playing dynasty, I vividly remember my first ever dynasty fantasy football draft. And keep in mind, I was not the same dynasty player that I am right now. Uh, but in that dynasty draft, I took Joe Mixon at the 111. He was a first round pick and it was Joe Mixon. Honestly, it worked out fine. I won a couple championships back to back. There's some rings that are over there on the bookshelf that I have from that team. Uh, But other than that, like I think where the running back position is being drafted right now, it feels appropriate for those guys. Obviously for this specific draft in general, the Chris McCaffrey, we don't expect that. That's an outlier. That's probably not something that we should necessarily be talking about anyways. But that Bijan Robinson, Jameer Gibbs, Brees Hall, middle to late second round, it feels like you're getting a difference maker at a position that's hard to find difference makers in because it feels like the running back position is so much a I mean we talk about in the NFL a position by committee right like it's there's not a lot of bell cows anymore and it feels like Jameer Gibbs even though he's not a bell cow he's still going to give you those high end numbers we saw it this year Bijan we expect him to be one Brees Hall definitely is one and then even as you get around the turn uh, Jonathan Taylor he's a guy that I expect to be there as well so I think uh, this position is a position that's getting faded but those four guys specifically Taylor, Hall, Gibbs, uh, Bijan. Those guys, I think, are worthy of the draft capital of where they're at. But pretty much everybody else, I think you can fade till late. So, when perfect transition into the third round. So, we had Jaden Daniels and Drake May both fall to the 3-6, 3-7. I was so upset. Shout out to War for sniping me with Drake May at the 3-7. <laughs> but it feels like last year, as we got approached the rookie draft, we started to see QB3 and QB4 of the class, which at that point was CJ Stroud and Bryce Young, slowly start to creep up into the back half of the second round. Got into 
to about the midpoint of the second round of startup drafts. Do we think that same thing's going to happen for Jaden Daniels and Drake May as we kind of get more into the rookie hype season? Or do we just think that there may be a little bit less caliber? There was less talent at the top last year, causing some of those younger quarterbacks to get pushed up the draft boards. Oh, I think it definitely will. I, I definitely fully expect Jaden Daniels and Drake May to at least be early thirds. I think even Jaden Daniels potentially being into that second round just because of his rushing upside. Also, as soon as we see these landing spots, like right now, I feel like we're looking at them as prospects. But when you see landing spots and you can kind of start to put puzzle pieces together, like for example, if Daniels or May, if if they're one of the guys that Minnesota trades up to and you're like, Daniels is throwing to Justin Jefferson, why are we not going to bump him up the board? I feel like that's something that people will do. And even if you look at like Terry McLaurin and all these other guys, like it's just going to get people more excited for these prospects. So I think they will move up a little bit more. And it's going to be interesting because even like Malik Neighbors, who is being drafted above him, probably is going to move up some more. So like there's going to be some rookies that continue to move up boards, but that means you're going to get some values and potentially some AJ Browns, Garrett Wilsons that start to slide down the board. No, I'm right there with you. There's so many great wide receivers when we're looking like AJ Brown, Puka Nakua in the early third round, Malik Neighbors, Tyreek Hill, Chris Olave, Drake London, depends on how you view Jersey Drake, but absolutely love this third round. Moving on to kind of how the fourth round went down. Still, you got a lot of these younger wide receivers. I know I drafted Nico Collins at the 405. We've had our talks about this on other shows about... We, I think we value Nico Collins just a little bit differently at this a point. Bit differently. Yeah. But you still have Kyle Pitts at the 4'6, Mark Andrews at the 4'8. This was a super flex tight end premium. So the fact that you're able to get Kyle Pitts and Mark Andrews in the fourth round, I think that's incredible value. Like, what kind of stands out to you about this fourth round um, and some of the greatest values that you're seeing? For me, when I look at this fourth round, what kind of stands out is this is what I was talking about, where I said, like, that middle round wide receiver, it really gets to a point where, like, you're just getting so much value here. I mean, I look at this, this board and you have Tank Dell, Brandon. Now you... Uh, Michael Pittman, Nico Collins, Devontae Smith, Jalen Waddle. Like, there's guys in here that were top 10 wide receivers in 2023, and they're coming off the board as like wide receiver 14, 15, 16, 17. Like, that's where these guys are going. So, to me, it feels like this is the best value to kind of start loading up that wide receiver room, especially here and probably the next couple rounds after it, because these guys are guys that people probably don't necessarily love because they're 26, they're 27, they're 28 years old. And in dynasty purposes, it's not as good as getting the 23 year old where people are so excited about the 23 year old like Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors or Puka Nakua but uh, I do think that they're going to perform almost just as well so when you get a guy like that that's what stands out to me the value in this year's startups is right here probably rounds four through seven where you can hammer that wide receiver position no and absolutely so I'm going to share this little graphic where we got the first six rounds of Andrew's draft compared to the first six rounds of my draft and Andrew I like your team better we'll just we're just going to say it. I love the strategy of being able to double tap on that quarterback. You got Jonathan Taylor as your hero RB, and then you just went wide receiver, wide receiver, wide receiver, where I just went one quarterback and then absolutely hammered five wide receivers. I just felt like the value of wide receivers kept falling to me. It was unfortunate though, because I ended up getting myself into a pickle with my QB2 situation. So if you're in a super flex league, know that the quarterback position, it gets shallow really, really quick, especially like I said, right now, before we get even to the NFL draft, once we get to the NFL draft, it's going to get even more shallow as a lot of these quarterbacks get pushed up the board. So if you wait on quarterback, I think you're going to be able to take some of these other the positions. Sometimes it does not happen. So out of your first six picks, kind of when we were looking fourth through sixth round, like who was your favorite pick that you picked right here? Yeah. I mean, fourth through six, I think my favorite pick is probably going to be, I, I mean, I don't, I don't feel like I have a favorite out of these ones. I think DK Metcalf might've been a decent value down there. Um, Jalen Waddle feels like I get a lot of upside uh, at that 410. I will say though, uh, in this draft, I had totally forgot. I spaced for a second where the rookie, because the ADPs of the rookies are are much, much lower than where they should Correct. be. I think that Zay Flowers pick, if I could go back and redo it, Romo Dunze went like three picks later. I would rather have Romo Dunze than Zay Flowers. So that's something that I would much rather have a time machine to go back and redo, but uh, still like Zay Flowers, nothing against Zay Flowers. I just think Romo Dunze is a little bit better. And I, that was just oversight on my ADPs when I was sitting here trying to stream and draft a team at the same time. No, hundred percent. Well, and you're even looking like you got these wide receivers that we've talked about at Nas of you're either competing or you're rebuilding, but you kind of get into this range. DJ Moore, he's about to turn 27, could probably mm -hmm. sway either way. You got Zay Flowers, more probably more on the rebuilding side, but has produced Romo Dunze, T Higgins, Rasheed Rice. Like you got a lot of good options here in the fifth round, but then you still have your boy TJ Hawkinson falls to the five seven, which in its what this is tight end six right now in tight a super end, yeah. yeah tight end six in a 
tight end premium league. Kind of crazy. I know he's got the injury concerns. Now, Ward did go tight end, tight end. We probably would not recommend that to any of any people listening, thinking about a dynasty startup strategy. But when you do get two incredibly young and productive tight ends... Well, we'll have to see with Kyle Pitts if he's going to be productive. We assume he's going to be productive with Kirk Cousins. What What we are hope. your kind of thoughts with TJ Hawkinson in the fifth round? Yeah, I mean, I think the depreciated ADP is because of the ACL injury. And that's, you know, that's something that we knew was going to happen. In fact, like I honestly project him to slide even a little bit more as we get more and more into startups closer to the season, because I assume that as we get closer to the season, you'll get some reports where maybe he's ahead of schedule, but maybe he doesn't look as good because he's recovering from a terrible knee injury. I mean, that's what we expect to happen. This is also guy that's probably going to miss the first half of the season i just think for me we have not seen the floor of where his adp is going to be if you want to draft tj hawkinson at a value i don't mind drafting him here i think that's a value for him it's just i think it's going to keep going I, I mean i could definitely see dalton kincaid surpassing him and i could see tj hawkinson falling into that sixth round kind of where stefan Diggs and josh jacobs are right there like i could see him keep going and if that's where you want to buy in on him i i definitely support that decision i like buying players when the value gets low especially highly productive good players players when the value gets low. That's kind of a reason why I'm in on Stefan Diggs this season. But uh, that is that is kind of how I feel about TJ Hawkinson. I just think it's going to continue sliding. But I don't I don't think this is a bad value. I just don't necessarily support the Kyle Pitts plus TJ Hawkinson in the fourth and fifth round. So moving on to the sixth round, I ended up taking JSN over a guy like Kirk Cousins over a quarterback like JJ McCarthy. Is that something that you would have done? Or would you have leaned trying to get my QB two in the sixth round right here? No, I mean, I think looking at how your build was going up to that point, like I'm not adding a Kirk Cousins. I feel like he doesn't fit the narrative for where your team is going. He doesn't fit the build. Maybe JJ McCarthy would be something that I would have looked at because I do think that JJ McCarthy is going to get top five draft capital here in a month at the NFL draft. So maybe that's something I would have considered, especially because you were drafting Jackson Smith as your fifth wide receiver and not necessarily like a third or a fourth wide receiver. I, I probably would have looked at JJ McCarthy but I don't hate the Jackson Smith pick, especially because you followed it up with Bryce Young one round later. Yeah, and you took DK in the sixth, and then you got Brian Thomas in the seventh. So we talked about how you're doing here RB. So how how are you valuing, you get to the fifth to kind of eighth rounds. How are you viewing the running back position? How are you feeling like you're going to kind of, I know ADPs, whoever falls to you, but is there kind of a sort of a strategy that you were going with? Because you did hammer wide receiver four straight times. Yeah, I mean, that's really the strategy that I like to do. I think three to four picks at that wide receiver position is where I'm at, because as I look, at the running back position when we get a little bit further it's basically putting me out of the tier of the aging veterans you get the josh jacobs you get the some of the other guys in there like there's going to be alvin kamara and derrick henry that can kind of fall up into that area as well they're in eighth round in this one but i think they're all kind of in that bunch you also have like guys that are kind of ambiguous like deandre swift we don't necessarily know what that's going to look like rashad white had a good year but what is that going to look like going into uh you know 2024. I think there's a lot of stuff in here that's so ambiguous at the running back position. So load me up at the wide receiver because later on, I think it puts you in a tier of players where we can talk about it as we get down there. But like David Montgomery, Joe Mixon, Najee Harris, Javante Williams, Tajay Spears, Brian Robinson, Trey Benson, Jonathan Brooks. Like there's a whole bunch of running backs that I feel like can give you running back two numbers. And what I like to do for that is I like to kind of play my running back two position by a committee almost where I am drafting two or three guys that I think I can just play in that running back two slot any given week. No, I totally agree. And I think the thing that we as the dynasty community or dynasty analysts or people that love dynasty content, we love to just push the running backs to the side. Like in on your team, I know you took Jonathan Taylor in the third round, but like imagine if you didn't and you ended up with Javante Williams and Tajay Spears as your top two running backs. Like yeah. as much as we do hate the ageism and we hate running backs because we know, like we said, the NFL doesn't value them. So therefore we're not going to value them because we don't know. We can really only like safely project them. Maybe a year, two years out in advance. Otherwise, I mean, unless it's Bijan Robinson where you know he's going to be on that rookie contract, there's not a lot of guys like that that we can kind of project out. I just get a little bit worried too because you still got to have those fantasy football points. To, we want to win championships. So like in your certain yeah. build, you got to have some of these elite level studs at the top. So you do have to invest in running backs, but I agree with you, being able to get some of these lower end values. And like Derrick Henry went at the 8-7. What are our thoughts yeah. kind of with Derrick Henry, Baltimore, better situation. We know it's 
pretty year to year with Derrick Henry at this point. I feel like the eighth round is insane value for Derrick Henry. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the eighth round is good value as well. Uh, it feels like Derrick Henry is a guy, he's so hard for me to judge right now because I feel like everything analytically tells us that he should not be able to do this. But when you watch him play, it's like, well, he hasn't really lost a step either. So I don't really know how to judge him. Um, but I do think that the situation where he's going into Baltimore, like I said it on a previous video earlier uh, when we were doing free agents this this spring it was Derrick Henry has the real opportunity to probably score 12 to 15 touchdowns in this Baltimore Ravens offense and if he does that he's probably going to put up low end running back one numbers just off of the touchdowns alone not to mention he could be hyper efficient on the ground in this offense because every running back seems to be hyper efficient behind Lamar Jackson and I don't know this feels like you could have a running back one in the eighth round now maybe you're renting it for one year if you can get one year out of your running back position where he's giving you top 12 numbers I think that's kind of how we need to play the running back position in general general if it's not one of these top four guys that we talked about earlier like I can't really project more than one one or two seasons 100% and for your last few picks so like I said you drafted Brian Thomas in the seventh round eighth round you go Will Levis then you double mm-hmm. tap running back with Javante and Tajay Spears and then you get Pat Frymuth in the 11th Will Levis at the eighth round that feels like insane value too when he would be your QB3 on a Superflex team yeah it, it it's definitely a pick that I was I was really hoping that he fell because when when you look at the guys who go behind him it's it's like Justin Fields, Matthew Stafford. We had Tommy DeVito, Aaron Rodgers, Bo Nix. Like some of these guys all go after him. It felt like he was one of the last that I felt like could take a big jump in year two if he's in the right situation. You know, Brian Callahan coming from the Bengals, like a good offensive scheme. Maybe he takes that jump in year two and all of a sudden we're viewing Will Levis kind of where Baker Mayfield went in this mock draft, which was a fifth round startup pick. And so I like the upside swing there with Will Levis. It just felt like if he doesn't hit, I already have Stroud and Lawrence and I'm not really too worried about finding that third quarterback right away I could probably find it in a 2025 rookie draft or a 2026 rookie draft or even you know you trade for a aging vet like Geno Smith Gardner Minshew who gets a bridge quarterback year like that's that's a position that's kind of easy to fix so I just took the upside swing with Will Levis and it felt like good value and he did feel like he was the last one kind of in that tier of younger quarterbacks that could still improve yeah and then I went with Alvin Kamara Trey Benson Evan Ingram and then Bo Nix which Bo Nix if he does get first round NFL draft capital he will not be going at the 11th round of any startup. So he probably gets pushed up to at least the eighth, maybe if not even the seventh, Mm. if that ends up happening. So looking at our two teams, honestly, like, I mean, I like your team better personally. I like your strategy. I think it's easy. I do think if you have one of the top five picks, you kind of get that guaranteed stud at the top. Now, granted, I'm not taking Anthony Richardson over Lamar Jackson, Jalen Hurts, even Joe Burrow, probably not even over Caleb Williams. So that's a little bit of a reach by Anthony Mack in this draft. But still at the same time, I I just, I'm upset. I wish Kyler Murray would have fell to me in the second round. Yeah. Wish maybe Drake May would have fallen to me in the third because my quarterback situation is uh, not ideal. I'm probably over here. I'm in the productive struggle. You're competing for a championship. You're going to win the money. You're going to take my money. So kind of wrapping this all up what we give the people with the dynasty strategy focus on quarterbacks first two rounds load up on wide receivers if you get the option to get one of these elite level running backs take it but otherwise we're punting running backs until seventh through ninth rounds is that kind of how you kind of go into each and every draft yeah i mean that's the way that i like to do it right now and like i said depending on where you're picking you know where I'm at at the 103 or whether you're back where you are at the 108 like those players are going to differ but the strategy is still going to remain the same so for me I like to double tap the quarterback position load up on those middle round wide receivers and in a tight end premium league that's the only position that I had to sacrifice here because I went a hero running back but the difference is you can kind of swap that so like if you miss out on that top tier of running back maybe that's where you take an elite tight end and then you go with the lower tiered running backs there so you can kind of swap those as you see them fit but uh I think Either way, the team would still look good. I mean, imagine if I don't get Jonathan Taylor, but I just end up drafting a Trey McBride or something or a Sam Laporta there, and then I'm just loading up on, you know, middle round or, or late round running backs. Yeah, I feel like it still feels pretty good either way. It's just you can switch the strategy no matter what tier you miss out on. No, 100%. Well, Andrew, thank you so much for coming on the channel today, guys. Go. All of his information is linked down below. So go subscribe to his YouTube channel. He's got a free Discord. Go follow him on X. And Andrew, like I said, until next time, you're a friend of the channel. We'll definitely be doing more content in the future. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Peace out.